Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining from. We are, we're really pleased that you are able to make our time to join us. My name is Joyce Brown. Um, I am Women's Health and Mother Ed Foundation's Programs Manager uh, and Project Lead on Hunger Politics. Um, this very important event is organized uh, in collaboration with the African Center for Biodiversity and um, Friends of the Earth, Nigeria and Africa. So once again, you're warmly welcome. Before we we'll continue, we'd just like to um, say that there is uh, French interpretation available. So you can click on interpretation or translation um, and then choose the language you prefer. Uh, and also to say that we uh, the event is being recorded and we would love to share, uh, especially on YouTube. We would also share the, the recording with participants once we are once we are very timely and important meeting. Something that is um, really uh, consumers, not just for farmers, but for everyone as uh, as much as we consume food. And uh, I would uh, just briefly uh, introduce Home and what we do before um, we continue, and then after now. Sabrina would, uh, uh, would jump in with a few remarks before we proceed. So Home Health of Mother Earth Foundation is, uh, is an ecological think tank and an advocacy organization promoting food sovereignty as well as environmental and climate justice in Africa, in Nigeria and in Africa at large. So uh, we have uh, two main, uh, we have some focus areas. Uh, one is on hunger politics that addresses issues of uh, food and farmers' rights, touching biosafety, biodiversity, um, and forests. And then he asked the question why people are hungry, looking at forces that tend to undermine the, right, the rights of people to safe food and healthy food systems. So we also um, address issues relating to uh, environmental and climate justice and then we have that third area that uh, uh, seeks to promote knowledge and uh, understanding on uh, key environmental and food justice issues so as we go on we'll share our website and that of uh, uh, the african center for biodiversity so you can um, follow up for more information later so um we are gathered here today um we have journalists in our news because it's, um, it's basically a press conference and then uh, we're hoping that okay can i'm having a serious hold back can 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 everyone hear me yes i can hear you yes, yes. We can hear you yes we can hear you go ahead all right, I was muted for a bit. Yes, so I, I was saying that we have here with us journalists, not just from Nigeria, but from across Africa. And we're hoping that the issues discussed here will be um, shared widely um, so that our peoples, our governments can make informed decisions to protect uh, our food system, our health and our environment. So um, this conference, the focus is on a genetically modified cowpea, also known as uh, BT cowpea or PBR cowpea. And uh, cowpea is a staple food for Africans. It's a major source of protein and also a major source of income for our people. So when we are considering the implications that genetic, the genetically modified variety has, then we know we are uh, talking about something really serious. So the process of genetic modification is, is one of increasing concern uh, because now not just crops are being uh, modified, they're, 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 there's news that even chickens are uh, now genetically modified in Nigeria, that they will soon be, be introduced to, to Nigeria. So um, 
the challenge with BT Calpi is not uh, is not one for Nigeria alone. Um, the neighboring countries are also under pressure to to adopt the variety, and that includes Ghana and Burkina Faso, as well as other West African countries. So that's why we need all of us to come together to examine um, these implications and then. Um, look for uh, take action going forward. So once again, you are very welcome to this um, event. Um, also to let us know that um, uh, the program is actually uh, sort of divided into two. We have two panel sessions uh, where uh, as part researchers, farmers, and uh, food and environmental activists will be uh, speaking to us. And then after those two sessions, there is space for questions and answers. But you can feel free to put in your questions either in the Q&A box or in the chat box as the event is going on. Also, I uh, would, like would like to get to know everyone who is joining. And so while um, I'll call on Sabrina to say a few words, you could just uh, uh, put in your name on the chat box, tell us where you are uh, joining from. If you're a media person, if you're a journalist, kindly tell us your, um, the media house you will present in the chat box so we can have a sense of who is here with us. And also to stay with us to kindly keep our microphones muted throughout. So if there are further information we need to send to us, we'll share them in the chat box as we proceed. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Sabrina to uh, say a few uh, words before we uh, go ahead. Hello, Sabrina, you have the floor, please. Um, hello, Joyce. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, hello? Yeah, you, you went off for a bit, but we can hear you now. Okay, great. Okay, so um, um, my name is Sabrina Masindula, as introduced by Joyce, and I work at the African Center for Biodiversity as a researcher and an outreach and advocacy officer. Now, ACB is a um, research and advocacy organization working towards food sovereignty and agroecology in Africa with focus on biosafety, uh, seed systems, um, and agricultural biodiversity. And we have uh, an extensive track record on GMOs on the continent for the past 18 years. So we, we are happy to co-host this event with, um, with the Home F. And I would just like to begin by saying a few remarks uh, from the African Center for Biodiversity. Now, for more than 25 years, um, we have seen um, a series or an array of uh, development in interventions on, on the continent, on GM, of GM con um, interventions on the African continent, which have costed millions and millions of dollars to push for genetically modified crops. And these are based on old and new GM technologies. And these are pushed um, supposedly to solve you know, some of the challenges that we face, such as uh, poverty, hunger, malnutrition, among others. But these are false solutions because these interventions do not in any way support, um, you know, deliver the promises that they have set to, been set to, to deliver. Now, these interventions have been funded principally by the USAID and the biotech industry through the um, AATF. And also in the last 15 years or so, we've seen philanthropic capitalists, uh, such as the Gates, Rockefeller Foundation, among others, um, who have been funding these interventions on the continent. Now, we've seen failures uh, of these promises that GM crops 
are going to deliver on the African continent. For example, the, the case of Burkina Faso and BT Cotton is very vivid. Uh, the case of South Africa, uh, when it comes to BT maize, um, we've seen the failure of the drought tolerant variety that is now being pushed into several other African countries. And the, the, the challenge with these interventions is that they, they further are set to entrench industrial agriculture and they reinforce indebtedness, inequalities, and social exclusion for the majority of smallholder farmers and in particular women. Now we cannot uh, speak about commercial approval of GM cowpea in Nigeria and the other countries that you know, GM cowpea is being targeted such as Burkina Faso and Ghana without taking into account the larger industrial agricultural push in, in these countries, but also in particularly in Nigeria which have been earmarked for agrarian extractivism and the continental free trade areas agreement. Now the agenda being pushed is that all of our African countries need to modernize African agriculture through dependency of GM technologies and value chain development, largely driven by the corporates. As ACB, we have written extensively uh, about um, the targeting of orphan crops on the continent. And we have warned about the seed industry's target on Africa's lucrative cowpea and seed markets uh, since 2015. Now, this for Nigeria to obtain a commercial approval of, um, for, for a center of origin crop, which is cowpea, is actually a major insult to our African food systems. But it also is for the biotech industry, a victory for them. We have made solid arguments targeting the biosafety issues, which will be covered by the first panel um, where Dr. Christopher, Christoph Ten from Test Biotech will speak. And he will highlight issues around risk assessment, in particular on the unintended effects of BT toxins of the plant on the environment and on non-target organisms, issues about gene flow and contamination of a center of origin and diversity. It's, it's a pity that Nigeria being the largest producer of cowpea and this introduction is happening in Nigeria, which you know, West Africa is also a lucrative and burgeoning market for cowpea is going to affect millions of smallholder farmers. And it's going to have dire implications on their production practices on women because cowpea is a woman's crop. It's going to impact on diversity on the farm and also have negative socioeconomic impacts on smallholder farmers. We must reject genetic engineering of our heritage and continue to reject these false solutions for the African people. Rather, we should encourage real solutions rooted in African people and democracy. And we sh most of all, we should, we must and should protect and defend our African heritage. So this is a critical space for us today. We will hear from our panelists um, the, the two panels that have been organized for today and who range from scientists, experts, smallholder farmers on implications of genetic engineering of cowpea um, in Africa. Welcome, and we hope that you will enjoy the session. Thank you, Joyce, and back to you. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for that uh, speech. Um, yes, yeah, so, Quickly, we would move forward and uh, to take us forward to be welcome words from the Director of Health of Mother Earth Foundation, uh, Nimu Basi. He's an author, he's an uh, environmental and food sovereignty activist, done extensive work on issues relating to food and farmers' rights. And he would uh, speak to us briefly just before we go on to the panel sessions. Welcome, Nimo. 
Thank you so much, Joyce, and thanks, Sabrina, for those words. Thanks to everyone who has joined this uh, press conference today. Thanks to the panelists. Uh, I'm really grateful for the African Center for Biodiversity for uh, co-hosting this event, which is of very high significance to all Africans and to all lovers of food sovereignty in the world. Uh, it has often been said that one of the ways to colonize a people is by dismantling or subverting their culture. This pathway is also effective for building dependency and disrupting the systems that organically secures the health of populations in our countries. In terms of agricultural and food systems, the disruption is most effective when staple crops such as uh, cowpea or beans are targeted, appropriated through patenting and presented as mere merchandise. Food is fast becoming, food is also fast becoming an instrument of control and power. Uh, it is or getting more entrenched as a system of Right. So science has been used as a cloak for the introduction of foods of dubious value and quality. The quest to solve perceived problems through artificial means introduces new problems. And we all know this. But some of these problems can become intractable. Today, we see unrelenting forces seeking to control our food and agricultural systems with attendant disregard for indigenous knowledge, natural cycles, biodiversity, and livelihoods of communities. We are very concerned that food is being seen as a mere commodity or a mechanical or chemical product from a factory or laboratory. The truth is that eating, eating is beyond, it's not just swallowing food to satisfy hunger. Food has deep cultural and spiritual anchors with special significance evident in many religious observances. Food is central to our culture. So, and food supply across Africa depends largely on the maintenance of a healthy and thriving biodiversity. Our farmers save, reproduce, and share seeds. Understanding that these seeds encapsulate life, uh, this is why our farmers do this. And our communities engage in mixed cropping and harvest a mix of fruits, tubers, vegetables that yield foods that are rich and healthy, providing needed nutrition and building defenses against illnesses. They have a strong link to what is presented as food and harvest are never mechanical exercises. Moreover, many of our farmers do not see food production as mere business or for profit. But these practices are being threatened by the genetic modification of seeds, particularly those that make up our staple foods as both Sabrina and Joyce have emphasized. So today we're speaking particularly of genetically engineered beans or cowpea, popular, I mean, beans or cowpea, they call it cowpea, but we all call it beans uh, in Nigeria. And we're drawing attention to the fact that Designing or engineering beans to kill insects is simply making the beans an insecticide. So insecticidal beans can also kill non-target organisms. And that even the target pest can develop, even the target pest can develop resistance. In the same vein, when crops are genetically engineered to withstand herbicides, we cannot ignore the fact that they kill other plants and microbial life, and not only the so-called weeds. So these modifications interfere with the webs of life in ecosystems. And this has intergenerational 
consequences. That is why this press conference is so central and so important. The promoters, promoters of BT Kaupi claim that it will translate to improved food security in Nigeria due to availability of much higher amounts of Kaupi. One concern that cannot be overlooked is that this genetically engineered variety will utterly contaminate natural varieties through cross-pollination. This means that even where a farmer chooses not to grow the GM variety, they'll be forced to harvest GM varieties because of uh, cross-pollination and contamination. So rather than look at a season, a season rather than look at it for what a season of food security, Nigeria and Africa is actually stepping into an era of uncertainty, of gross unpredictability, and instability of food supply and resultant food insecurity. The, the genetically engineered beans uh, recently approved for commercial release in Nigeria despite objections. Uh, it's modified with the transgene CRY 1AB. You're going to hear more of this from the technical experts on this conference. But most of these uh, genetically engineered events are prepared overseas and brought for testing in Africa. And yet our researchers boast that we are adequately equipped and innovative to accept these through where technologies. The GMO beans, for example, originally came from Monsanto and were brought to Africa on supposedly humanitarian grounds. I would do know that this is not humanitarian whatsoever. It's just a wish to penetrate the market. And we reject the using of Africa as a testing ground for novel and risky technologies. Promoters of these technologies fight against strict liability clauses in national health safety laws. They don't want strict liability in our laws. We've seen this in Nigeria, the struggle in Zambia and in Uganda. In fact, in Uganda, that has a strict liability clause, they are calling the government or the promoters of GMOs are calling the government of, uh, of Uganda uh, as being anti-science. Can you imagine that? And there are attempts to overlook the precautionary principle, which is a bedrock of our safety regulation. Simply put, the precautionary principle advises that where there are doubts regarding human and animal or environmental safety, we should hold the brakes. And good, good genetic engineering science must not leave room for doubt. And where harms manifest, the producer should be held strictly liable. As you are already aware, this press conference is a platform for exposing the grave risk our food and agricultural system faces, our face through the introduction of GMO beans. Besides the environmental and health risk, our people, people's right to choose what variety to plant and what food to eat is absolutely breached by the introduction of the GM beans, a staple and critical source of protein for our people. The right to choose is eliminated because our food systems do not allow for labeling. You can't label the way our foods are being sold by the street sites and village markets. So this right is fundamental. It's our human right to choose, our human right to save food, and our people should not be ambushed to eating any risky material. So we call on farmers across Africa to reject BT cowpea seeds and continue to protect our food system as they've done. At this point, I thank you all for the attention, for being a part of this conference, and I turn it back to Joyce and Sabrina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nemo, for those very insightful words. Uh, I think there are key things that stand out. Food is uh, cultural and it has some real um, deep religious values for our peoples. And so when we talk about issues relating to food, it's something that we all should uh, be very much concerned about, especially because some of these processes are such that cannot be easily managed or reversed. So we'll go right on quickly to the to the first panel session. And then I would just in, uh, introduce the moderator for the panel who will then introduce the speakers and we will go forward. But just to mention to our speakers that you should kindly not speak so fast because of the translation so that uh, those who are listening to the French 
uh, translation can um, get all the information clearly. So to take us on the first panel, the, the moderator for that panel, um, that would uh, briefly introduce her. Uh, she's an environmental and human, she's an environmental human and food rights ad advocate. She's uh, an astute food sovereignty campaigner and a frontline Amazon against the onslaught of biotech companies and their local agents on seeds and food systems in Nigeria and in Africa. Um, she's the immediate past Board of the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa at, at Friends of the Earth. I'm talking about Marianne Bassi. Okay, she would uh, come up quickly and take the next session. The floor is yours, Marianne. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joyce, um, for that introduction. And I want to welcome everybody. You can see that. Um, we have a full house and um, I'm happy for that because this is a very pertinent discussion which affects all of us in Africa. So I'm very happy to have everyone here and without wasting time, I'm going to introduce um, the panel that will be interrogating this first section which talks about the health and environmental implications of GMO in our environment. Already, Sabrina, Joyce, and Nemo have already given us like a brief highlight into what we'll be discussing today. In this first panel, we have very four powerful um, experts who have um, who really know the depths of this discussion. And um, I don't, I don't. The first person has already been introduced. In Nigeria, we call him our ancestor of activist, activism. And then um, he doesn't relent, he doesn't shy away in talking to our government and calling them out. He's been introduced severally here. His name is Nimo Basi. He's an environmental activist, author, and right livelihood laureate. He chaired Friends of the Earth International from 2008 through 2012 and was the executive director of Environmental Rights Action for two decades. He's currently the director of Health, Mother Health Foundation, and he chairs various boards and foundation. Welcome, Nemo. The second person in this panel is Ifai, Dr. Ifai Kashme. We are very happy to have him at our corner. I mean, we have most scientists in most of the countries at the pockets of people who play them and they silence them. But he, Dr. Ifani has been very rugged. He's been speaking out, saying the truth, science for people, not science for profit. He's a medical and molecular microbiologist at the University of Abuja, Nigeria. He's an astute researcher and has worked extensively on biosafety and biosecurity. He's a public health consultant and public affairs analyst. He was one of the authors of the maiden edition of OMS report on the state of biosafety in Nigeria. Welcome Dr. Ifai, I'm very happy to have you here once again, my brother and comrade. We have another expert in this panel. I mean, it's well constituted. We are lucky to have all this great lineup of people. He is Dr. Christoph then, he is the executive director of Test biotech. I really like this one. Test biotech, which actually test anything that is sent to us. Test our food. Test the laws. Test the policies. Test biotech. He also acts as a coordinator for the coalition No Patents on Seeds. He has worked for about twenty years on issue in the field of biotechnology. Till the end of 20, 2007, he was Greenpeace Germany's expert and also head of department on agriculture, genetic engineering, and consumers affairs. He recently co-authored the report on a review of the RICS assessment of the genetically engineered BT cowpea approved for cultivation in Nigeria. Welcome, great panelists. 
to kick off this discussion, I want to I remember we have like five minutes, but I want us to be free to speak because you are all experts in your field and you've been dealing with this for more than some of you for more than 20 years, some for 15 years, some for 10 years. So I want to start with Nemo. I mean, you've spoken extensively. I want you to just speak to us briefly on what you, what you see as the health and environmental implications of GMO and specifically BT, cowpea on our environment and diversity and biodiversity. Also, I will also want you to say something about the Hundura Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, declaration that the law for protection of plant varieties is unconstitutional. That law, also known as the Monsanto law, has been declared to be unconstitutional. So please, Nemo, can you take it away from here? And then from there, I would go to Dr. Ifain. Thank you so much, Marian. Um, I'll, I'll be really quick so that Dr. Ifain will have a lot to, so that Christo will have more time because they have a lot to say about this. Um, basically, genetic engineering in food means food crops or animals means producing varieties that are never in existence and cannot be found in nature. And so you are talking about artificial living beings and living things that have been artificially manipulated. Uh, this should send uh, some signals to everyone that we are dealing with things that are not natural. And because we are not artificial beings, whatever is not natural would naturally not work well with us. So that more or less sums it up. Uh, it has threats that are unpredictable. And in terms of biodiversity, when you introduce a genetically modified plant, for example, for example, genetically modified beans, uh, nobody can go to the market and see a GMO beans seed and say, okay, this is GMO. It cannot, it cannot identify by physical examination. If you go to a farm where somebody has planted GMO beans, you cannot just look at the GMO beans growing on your farm and say, oh, this is genetically engineered. Because they look, they look as far as uh, looks, they look like nothing has been changed in them. But we do know that it's not just the look that we're dealing with, we're looking with the substance. What is in it? What is it made of? What is the characteristic of this, the seed or the leaf or whatever part we're going to consume? Because beans, for example, is not only not just the seeds that we eat. Uh, we use the leaves for people use the leaf for food also, and they use the leaves also for as fodder for feeding animals. Uh, some people have in the past argued that you could have genetically engineered cotton because it's not being consumed by humans. And we know that's a lie because cotton also enters a food chain. We have cotton oil that people use as food. We also cotton seed cakes that people also use either to feed animals or even to make their own food. So either way, this, all these things affect our food system. Some people have also said, and this is by way, just to explain, some people have said, well, you know, in countries like US, United States, they've been eating GMOs for so long, nobody, people are not dropping dead on the streets uh, after eating GMOs. But you know, uh, the, the, the argument is very hollow because the health impact, most of the health impacts, uh, talk about health impacts, most of the documents or reports that people uh, deal with, use to make arguments that GMOs are safe are extremely selective. As the scientists who study the risk of GMOs will tell you, will tell us there are so many health risks within this and I'll leave it for uh, our scientists to deal with that uh, because so many experiments have been carried out and there's been a lot of silence of scientists in the labs, in the, in the universities, in research institutes who called out the harms that come from, uh, from these products. It's also been said that GMOs will feed the growing population of Africa. Now, when people talk about the population of Africa, it's also a big insult because Africa is one of the most under, is a very underpopulated continent in the world. Okay, when I talk about GMOs, my blood really boils, so I'm sorry for being fast. I was saying that Africa, Africa is underpopulated. Africa is not anywhere as populated as Europe, for example. And so when people call the population issue, it's actually racist, that they would like to see Africa without Africans. And 
I'm serious about this because Africa is seen as a place to exploit. And people would like to see Africa as a farm for cultivating GMOs to feed animals or humans elsewhere, but not for Africa. We have a right to, uh, to defend our health by eating plants, crops, foods that are useful to us and not ones that are alien to our environment. Uh, one, one good example, uh, the issue of the, the issue that you cannot identify GMOs by just looking at them in the farm is a very big issue because it puts pressure on our farmers and our communities who wouldn't know when their products have been contaminated until a disease comes. When a dominant, when a dominant trait, when it trades and takes over a variety. If a disease emerges that attacks that, that particular trait, that will be disaster for Africa. And this is why we have to maintain our biodiversity and ensure that nothing, nothing, nothing is allowed to threaten the biodiversity, which builds resilience and ensures our food sovereignty. We need to grow crops that don't only meet our nutritional need, but also meet our cultural needs. And genetically engineered crops subvert all this. Thank you so much, Nimu. Thank you that you've said it, right? We couldn't have said it more. In fact, even for me, when I'm talking about GMOs, my bullet boils to 360 degrees. And uh, yes, we are not, we cannot be artificially engineered. We don't want this designer food. So they shouldn't serve it to us and we are not guinea pigs. Before I go to Dr. Kashmi, I want just maybe in one minute, what do you think of this uh, judgment by the Supreme Court of Honduras? I mean, one of the, they gave a five point, uh, 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 five points by, by declaring that judgment unconstitutional. And one of those points was that it, repre it represents an attack on the human rights to nutrition and health, as well as the right of populations to nutritious, healthy, and culturally appropriate foods in terms of access, availability, and safety. And it also contradicts their article, which recognizes the obligation of the state of Honduras to protect the environment with a view of protecting the health of the inhabitants. This came after 10 years of uh, civil society fighting and going to court. Do you think in Africa, we can get to that point where our government would take sides with the people and declare some of these laws illegal and the will of the people will be done and not the will of corporations. Just briefly before I go to Dr. Cashman, what do you think of this judgment? Sorry, Marianne, is that a question for me? Yes, I want, yeah, just, I want your views briefly on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were already on to Dr. Cashman. No, now, I'll get to uh, I think that was a very significant judgment and it's something that countries in Africa should wake up to uh, because they have a responsibility to protect Africans, to protect our people. Uh, in Nigeria, we are seeing a very dangerous trend and we should be worried because in the current constitution amendment process, our legislators uh, manipulated to eliminate the right to food from our constitution, from the, from the amendment. Uh, that is something to be worried about because the right to food is a universal right. It's a universal human right. And it's not something for nations to pick and choose to decide whether to allow or not. The same with the right to water. I was so shocked that when the United Nations was voting on the right to water, some countries in Africa decided not to vote for it. They voted against it. And this is an extremely embarrassing and shameful. Now, uh, the, the Honduras judgment underscores the fact of the precautionary principle. It also underscores the fact that we have a right to choose what to eat and what not to eat. Nobody should force us. And our, our cultural system, our food sharing system does not permit. We don't go to the market and pick a banana and say, which, from where did this banana come? What variety of banana is this? We don't have those labels on bananas. We don't have labels on our corn. We don't have labels on beans. We don't have labels on cassava. And so for anyone to say, to even decide to allow anything to the continent based on a law made elsewhere, it is actually very ingenious and colonial and dangerous. Thank you so much, Nemo. You've said it all. Um, I will now go to Dr. Kashmir. 
what do you think are the specific um, implications on the environment and on, on our health by this BT cotton, BT, I mean, BT cowpea that has been introduced into our environment in Nigeria and some parts in Africa? Dr. Ifai Kashme? Hi, Femi. Sorry, I think he's dropped off. Um, he's, he keeps dropping off. So um, I'm afraid, could you continue a little bit longer? Well, and I'll let you know when he's back. Oh, wait, he is. No, I see he's back now. Um, Stanley, can you take over now? Stanley, you're on mute. Um, Femi, is that what you want? You want Stanley to take over? Oh, he's just dropped off. He must have been dropping. That's why he didn't hear me. So, oh, wait, he's back. Stanley? Yes, can, can you take over now, please? Sorry, can we continue, please? And then when Stanley, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Ifani, please, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, whenever we discuss um, genetic engineering, particularly for yeah. food crop, um, I consider four subject things uh, being put at risk. And my position about it is that we're actually putting the whole stream of life at risk. What are they? Human, animal, plant, and environmental health is being put up for experimentation, huge experimentation for that matter. You see, um, the problem we have in Nigeria is that we have uh, a very terrible perspective to solving problem. When I was growing up in Nigeria, we had a local beans type known as potiscum beans produced in somewhere in the present day Yobe state. It was a type of beans well sought out for. Again, we had what was also known as Kotangora beans produced somewhere in present day Niger state. They were all well sought out for. Original stock of our traditional bean seed. Today, amongst other places, these two major towns I mentioned, renowned for beans production, including some others in Northwestern Nigeria, up towards Sokoto Axis. You can, it is no longer habitable places. They've been overtaken by insurgents. And so what disrupted beans production in Nigeria is not Muraka. We were sold a dummy in Nigeria that the best Muraka was eating and boring the pods and the beans leguminous stem. And therefore were leading to low yield from farmers. That was the dummy sold to Nigerians. It looked quite attractive. But I challenge Nigerian farmers today to go to those areas renowned for beans production to go and plant the dummy we have today called BT beans. Let me see if that will solve the problem of Boko Haram and banditry. What is leading to low production of beans in Nigeria is banditry and Boko Haram, and not the Muraka deception. Now, the point is very clear. Whatever can kill an insect, whatever can kill a pest, will kill humans. Short and simple. We have 
A, pe a pesticide we call in Nigeria sniper. The average person in Nigeria does know that those who want to commit suicide in Nigeria, all they do is to take a snip, a, a, a sip of sniper, and they are gone. And of course, that had led to the recent ban on its over-the-counter distribution in Nigeria. Meaning, therefore, that the cry protein A utilized in the modification of beans is poisonous to the Muraka pest. That is why it's able to withstand it. And the metabolites, the breakdown metabolites of this protein is carried over to humans who consume these beans. Because cry proteins has been recovered from caught blood, caught and fetal blood. And so that is to show that the metabolites are retained within the system. That's speaking to human health. Dr. Nemo spoke about what happens when you harvest off the bees, the stock is left in the field and that will lead to gene dispersal within the environment. And the stock is also fed to animals. And so you can understand why I did say that genetic modification of our traditional food in, 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 in Africa is actually an attack on the whole stream of life in Africa, particularly when they are not driven by African scientists. I do not see sincerity of purpose in the entire intervention. My worry is that two major staple crops are gone down and are already overtaken in Nigeria. And they are asking for Ghana, they are asking for other adjoining countries. Let me uh, say this. Before now, bees from Nigeria was in high demand in Europe. When we started our unbridled use of chemicals and eventually had gone the way of BT beans, today you cannot export Nigeria grown beans to any part of Europe. Now you can see the huge loss. Nobody will shed light on the economic impact of this uh, uh, somersault policy. Just last week, I was driving past and I saw buses around the, the national park that hosts the port cabin laboratory of the Nigerian Biosafety, uh, National Biosafety Management Agency. And I became curious. And for, later in the day, I realized that large army of young people from Kogi State University were being indoctrinated with falsehood in that place and they called it field experience. <laughs> when we had expert meeting on GMO in Nigeria, sometime 2016 or so, the man, the professor driving the process of uh, the BT project in Nigeria, I asked him to tell Nigerians his own contribution in the modification process. Everything was sent to him in a complete knockdown component. And he was busy coupling them here, experimenting them here. If you watch videos of the harvest, you will know that indeed the gene had just been let loose. What are the consequences? We can no longer say with certainty that we still have a traditional seed stock. We no longer have that in country. Now, if you watch, ask those who stock beans. Those who were stocking beans in Nigeria used to have running battle with weevil and pests eating their beans. Today, you can buy your beans and keep it anywhere because endogenously, it's been impregnated with pesticides. So you do not get weevil to eat them anymore. That is the problem. The other day, the major agent for the promotion of GM in Nigeria tweeted and said that Akara, made from BT beans, is sweeter than the original. And I replied and I said, thank God that considered 
that there's a major dispute between the traditional or the organic group and the poison you are selling Nigerians. He did, she couldn't reply. So the point need to be made clearly that as Africans, particularly the, the, the political class, it's time to begin to interrogate all these intervention technologies that are coming into the country that are not carrying our people along. Particularly when we know that in country, we do not have capacity in regard to infrastructure and facility for such experimentation. Now, if anybody is telling you that the massive modification of our staple food is not having a corollary impact on, 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 on Africans and particularly Nigerians, the person is not being sincere. Look at the trajectory prevalence of all types of cancers that we have today. Cancer now have no regard or respect for age or any part of the body. That's because of the massive exposure through our food system. So uh, a lot is happening and we need to ask questions. Human health is being compromised massively so. No empirical evidence has been generated because for you to say that these things do not cause harm like Nemo said, there must be a cross-sectional study of the people who had consumed them. My worry is that most of these approvals are done in African countries and in Nigeria based on dossier submissions made by the, G, the, 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 the biotech companies. And so our professors who are said to be members of the panel do not have hands-on experience with the product before they go ahead to approve them. No thorough risk assessment go into the approval process. It is mainly a review of the risk assessment as submitted by the biotech company. A lot is happening. And my worry is that even the very uh, the, the elite class in the African continent, they are not aware. I went into a highbrow uh, supermarket in Abuja last week. A lady picked a very good biscuit. And I said, oh, that's a nice biscuit. But it contains genetically modified material. And a well-educated posh lady asked me, and I nearly wept, what is genetically modified material? I had to tutor her a little bit and promised her that our next meeting in Abuja, I will invite her. That is just a tip of the iceberg. The politicians voted against it because they do not understand this conversation. The biotech companies move small envelope, uh, laden laced with uh, uh, forex, and they get any bill passed in Nigeria. That is why we had an amendment of a law that is uh, defect that is defective by default, and it was amended, and nobody spoke to the lacuna in the in the in the uh, primary law, and they got an amendment. So the challenge is huge. Um, I am happy that the pockets of uh, for, uh, some Africa countries are holding on to their own. I expected that since we had a president that belonged to the old stock, he would have held on. But honestly, in the last seven years, the pace with which Nigeria embraced uh, genetically modified crops has been unprecedented. Thank you so much, Dr. Ifai. Indeed, I mean, we have been served poison as food on our platter, and these people, they know exactly what they are doing. I mean, they've exchanged for some dollars, they would look the other way. Without wasting time, I'm going to turn it on to Dr. Christoph. I mean, we are so happy to have scientists like Dr. Ifani here, Dr. Christoph here, because sometimes when we talk, they say, oh, wait, wait, you're a lawyer, you're a woman, go and marry, all kind of terrible things they tell us just to intimidate us, but we refuse to be intimidated. For me, I, always, I can always contend them. We are so happy to have scientists here, activists here, 
and Dr. Christoph, who have worked on this law extensively. So Dr. Christoph, please, can you give up, tell us what you've discovered from your research and so we can sound the alarms and our journalists who are here would help us also spread the word to our sleeping governments. Thank you. So th <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting me. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah. I'm speaking from Munich, uh, and so I'm an outsider to the discussion in Africa, of course. But uh, we took a technical approach to look into the BT cowpeas and the risk assessment, as it is also performed in other regions in the world, and try to compare it um, in terms of methodology and, and outcome to the experience which is already published in uh, literature. So um, our approach from test biotech, it's uh, based on uh, science, it's technical, but we try to introduce the perspective from um, the environmental protection and health protection. So we are not interested in the development of any genetically engineered crops, we just try to have a look on them from the perspective of the protection goals. And on the PT cow piece now, uh, we also did a peer review publication. So we filed it to a journal and it was accepted and published, I think um, three weeks ago, something like that. Um, and so basis for our work was look into the um, material which was filed to the Nigerian government to allow commercial cultivation of the BT cowpeas. And as you all know, the BT cowpeas are producing a toxin, an insecticidal toxin, which is normally found uh, in bacteria and soil bacteria. And via genetic engineering, it was introduced into um, the cowpeas to protect them against the pot borer, Maruka. And um, so looking, to this to this category of plants, it's interesting to see what is, of course, the um, uh, characteristics of the plants. So, for example, what is a typical question for a risk assessment is the stability of the gene expression of the inserted gene on the Bt toxin. So, the question short is whether the Bt toxin is being expressed in a stable way and throughout in a certain concentration throughout the plants. And um, this is necessary to have any prediction on the toxicity of the plants if consumed by humans or animals or any other um, environmental interaction for with soil bacteria, etc. So we found um, that um, the data as given to the authorities in Nigeria seem to be a, uh, indicate uh, instability of the gene expression and a high uh, amount, a high concentration of the Bt toxin in certain parts of the plants. So we think further data would have been needed to really find out how much Bt protein is being produced in the plant during the vegetation. And this would be then the basis for next step in risk assessment. And these data, as far as we can see, were not provided to the Nigerian authorities. At least we did not have access to it. So, um, and the second thing is, what is the toxicity uh, of the Bt protein as produced by the plants? Is it the same as it is in the bacteria? Or is it changed? And in this case, we found that Bt cowpea are known to produce their own proteins, which to some extent protect also Bt cowpeas against insects. And these are called protease inhibitors or, or the proteins, and especially the protease inhibitors are proteins which meant to stop or delay degradation of proteins um, being produced by the plant. And in this case, there's a synergy between the plant protease, protease inhibitor and the Bt toxin, which in short, causes the Bt toxin being much more toxic if produced in the plant compared to the Bt toxins 
as naturally produced in the bacteria. And this higher toxicity was not taken into account by the applicant um, in the data as forwarded to the Nigerian authorities. So we think it was underestimated the toxicity of the plants as introduced into the environment for non-target organisms, for protected species, for soil organisms, and also if the Bt cowpeas are taken up uh, by a food chain by humans, the toxicity of um, the Bt toxin as produced is underestimated. And this would need much more detailed risk assessment before allowing the Bt cowpeas to be used for agricultural production. So uh, data were missing and some other data were showing that uh, is a wrong hypothesis in the beginning of the risk assessment. And this leads us to the conclusion that this risk assessment is not sufficient, should be, um, the cultivation should not be allowed on the basis of the data as provided and much more data and would be needed to come to a, um, a reliable conclusion. And finally, we also found out that um, the risk for gene flow of uh, the plants going to uh, regional varieties or wild relatives of, of, uh, of the cowpeas in Nigeria uh, was underestimated. Nigeria has one of the most valuable gene collections, seed collections for cowpeas, it's the biggest in the world. It's one of the countries of origin. So of course, um, gene flow, from the transgenic plants to the natural um, um, uh, gene pool has to be prevented. Um, but um, the data as provided by the applicant to the Nigerian authorities did not properly introduce the risk. It says uh, there is a very low risk for outgrowth. And but it's not, it, not really true because, for example, bumblebees are also uh, transferring the pollen over larger distances, also to wild species, to wild populations, and therefore also the risk for gene flow for contamination of um, the natural gene pool and the traditional varieties is systematically underestimated. And this is a long term risk for Nigeria and Western African countries, because as soon as the gene pool is contaminated and so is the transgenes are inherited, these, um, these uh, contaminated plants might become invasive and, 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 and override the natural populations and replace them. And this would mean major and long-term, really not um, in any way determined risks for the, for the environment and for the consumers and for food security and food safety of the continent, of the African continent. So this in result, I think, uh, raises the flag. Um, um, the cultivation, as far as we can see from the data, the cultivation of these cowpeas in Nigeria should not be allowed, should be discontinued. And much more data would be needed. And there are really high risk for um, the environment and also to some extent to the consumers. And this really has to be properly assessed before any conclusions can be taken on the safety and any political decisions can be taken whether these plants get grown in Africa or not. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christoph. I mean, we, we've heard from the mouth of a scientist. I mean, when people say we are maybe we are being very emotional, we are speaking from our, I mean, we are speaking from what we don't know, but these are people, these are scientists also telling us that this thing that we are about to plunge into is going to bring us stories of woes and doom. Thank you, thank you so much. This panel, this interesting panel made up of Nemo, Dr. Ifai, Dr. Christoph. I mean, I don't know if our government folks are here. I'm sure they are, if they are not here, their agents are here. I hope you hear and go and learn to do what is right. I've seen somebody write in the, in the chat that we were supposed to invite our uh, agency so that they come and give us their viewpoint. Their viewpoint is dump Nigeria with GMOs, dump Africa with, they're not listening to us. 
already when we talk to them, they call us terrorists. So then we know already what their viewpoint is. So we want people who are here, who are the spies here, please take this word to them, that the real scientists, scientists of the people are saying, this is a bad thing to do. Retrace your footsteps and do the right thing. So we are short of time. I just want to thank Dr. Christoph, Dr. Ifai, and Nemo for this interesting uh, highlights and insight into this discussion. I'm going to turn it on to Joyce now to introduce the next um, panel and uh, discussion. Please don't go away, stay on. We're going to take your questions at the end of the discussion. We don't hope to take your time, but please do stay on. This affects us. This affects our stormy. Everybody needs to hear this and we need to take this message back home. I'm happy that we have a lot of people from all over the continent here. So please stay on and keep the questions and the discussions going on the chat. Thank you once again, panel. And um, Joyce or Sabrina, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Marianne. And thank you to all the panelists for your wonderful insights. This is a conversation that will definitely continue. We can't exhaust everything in uh, the short time that we have. So you're welcome to uh, keep dropping your comments in the chat or your questions. And you can also write to us via our emails as we'll share shortly. So I will hand over now to Sabrina who will moderate the, the next session. Sabrina, the, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Joyce, and uh, thank you so much for the previous panel, which has highlighted key issues around um, implications of, you know, the, the adoption of BT Cowpea to the environment, to health, and, you know, other risks. Um, so the second panel will discuss about, um, we'll ha we have uh, farmer pan people from the farmers, I mean, representatives from the farmers. Um, if I can see if um, Edwin Bafu, are you there, Edwin? So the panel consists of Edwin Bafu. Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay, welcome, Edwin. Um, then we'll have La uh, Lavlin Ejim from the Network of Women and Youth in Agriculture. And we'll also have Omer Angoligan. Um, <laughs> Bonjour, Omer. The other new. Okay, so briefly, I'm just going to introduce the panelists. Uh, Edwin Bafu is the Director of Communications at Food Sovereignty Ghana. He recently played a very active role in the case for Food Sovereignty Ghana and uh, versus the National Biosafety Committee and four others before the Human Rights High Court in Accra. Uh, in the continuation of Ghana's first legal challenge on bioengineering of food. And um, thank you, to, uh, good, glad to have you Edwin here today. Lovelyn Ejim, she's a farmer and a president uh, of the Network of Women and Youth in Agriculture. Mrs. Lovelyn uh, Ejim is known as the first woman to lead African rural women to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in 2016 to demand for gender equality and women's rights as enshrined in various protocols and conventions like the African Charter on Human and People's Rights on the Rights of Women in Africa, otherwise known as the Maputo Protocol 2003. She has been at the forefront of the fight against GMOs in Nigeria. Welcome, Lovelyn. And lastly, we have Omer Angoligan, who is the president of the Rural Organization for Sustainable Agriculture uh, in Benin, and also the president of Synergy Paysan, the National Union of Peasants. He's a farmer and a promoter of peasant agroecology. He has also um, worked extensively on issues on farmers and seed rights. So the so our panelists um, Edwin Lovelin and uh, Omer we also also supposed to have someone from uh, Mali also a woman farmer but unfortunately she wasn't able to join us today so we have four questions directed to our panelists and I will start with Edwin and then we will go to Lovelin and then Omer. 
Um, so Edwin, um, you have been embroiled in a battle uh, in, in Ghana, not just on GMOs, but also generally on issues around UPOV. Um, so can you please tell us briefly uh, what your thoughts about BT cotton, I mean BT cowpea, uh, and the implications of farmers, farmer seed systems, farmers rights, uh, production practices, particularly also given the issues that issues that Christoph Ten, uh, Dr. Kasmir has raised and also Nemo in the previous panel. And that the, also the fact that this is being introduced in, you know, in where Africa is a center of origin and diversity of cowpea. So the implications of, you know, farmers on farmers, on farmer seed systems, production practices, uh, your thoughts about labeling, because I think Nemo has also touched briefly on issues around labels. The industry also claims that uh, BT cowpea will improve yields, boost competitiveness in the global market. Uh, in a previous post, it was said that um, about 8 million Nigerian farmers will be directly, will directly benefit. This is the claim from the industry. So what are your thoughts on this? And in your own experiences, what are the alternatives? Because we know that farmers are the ones that hold the real solutions to these challenges. Farmers are also scientists in their own rights. They know what is working in their farms. They know what pests are attacking what, as Dr. Kasmir has also, also mentioned about you know, the maruka and the other pests. So what are your views on this? Um, four questions. So over to you, Edwin. Sorry, just kind of repeat the first question. The first question. Okay, so how uh, um, does the introduction of BT cowpea going to, how is the introduction of BT cowpea going to impact on farmer seed systems, farmers' rights, and production practices, given the issues raised by Dr. Christoph Ten, uh, and I mean by the previous panelists? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, greetings to all our speakers. I'm very honored to be on this panel. Um, so quickly to the point, it's very depressing um, that we have to deal with such um, issues given the, 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 the times we are going through. Um, as a globe, you know, with uh, pandemics and, 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 and wars and all that, you, you need measured thought, uh, especially when it comes to our food system. So to listen to the testimonies of uh, the two doctors um, is very discouraging, given the fact that the policymakers in Ghana don't uh, see um, anything um, like what they are, you know, they describe. And um, to describe that the potential for a toxin to be more um, uh, poisonous um, than you think you have researched it to be, um, to grant human beings to eat it is a real threat on our, our livelihoods and farmers. But basically the introduction of these seeds, we all know the economies of scale um, that comes behind these uh, agro um, you know, businesses and the way they'll be able to get the seeds and distribute the seeds to the farthest corners. Um, this eventually is going to um, you know, influence the availability of the biodiversity that the peasant farmers have had um, and gathered for, 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 for millennia. Um, it's a direct threat on livelihoods because um, as uh, Nimo also spoke about earlier, the food is also spiritual and, you know, um, you know has other, 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 other uses, uh, expressions of wealth and culture. So the loss of these varieties is a threat on people's culture that is not seen in the dimensions we discuss um, often when we discuss these things. You know, the erosion of people's culture, unless you actually understand that culture, you don't understand what is being conceded. So um, the, the issue is uh, very disheartening, but it, 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 it should empower us to continue to be inspired that um, it's very obvious something wrong is being done and in the interest of the people, we should stand up and do you know, what is right. Um, on issues like um, 
the labeling. First of all, I'd like to say that in, in, in Africa, we all know that there are four basic problems that confront agriculture. And truly, truly, GMO seeds are not going to solve any of them at all, which is access to um, uh, roads, good roads for food to move from, you know, wherever it's planted, uh, 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 access to credits, um, uh, irrigation, and post-harvest uh, um, infrastructure. So GMO seeds are not going to solve any of these four pillars of the problems that face agriculture on the whole continent. And that is why it's important that policymakers and civil society like us must continue to advocate um, for it not to be introduced. Uh, they, they profess to GMO being you know, good and uh, safe to be eaten. But funnily, one of the promoters of GMO in Ghana, Dr. Alassan, uh, who was a former head of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR, he um, openly told the public, um, and we quoted him in court, that um, uh, there was no need to label GMOs because they were safe. Um, and we wonder why you would have such a position if indeed you, you find nothing wrong with them, uh, why you would want to stand to not allow labeling of, of these things and allow people to make an informed decision. So the issue of labeling in Ghana, the Ghana Standards Authority, sorry, the Ghana Food uh, and Drugs Authority, um, at the time of us going to court had said that they didn't have a regime to um, regulate uh, GMOs, although they had the mandate to regulate, you know, the, you know, the, the labeling of other foods, but GMOs at that time, it's recently that I think last year we were invited to um, an engagement um, and we also, you know, gave our views there that we didn't want any sort of a voluntary labeling system and we wanted a mandatory labeling system so that um, it wouldn't be to the discretion of a manufacturer whether or not to label contents that have GMO coming into Ghana. And they tried to speak about a minimum threshold of four to five percent of GM content because of the way that industry is and the value chain. But we still insisted that, being staples, we think that even five percent is not um, uh, is, is too much of a concession. So on the labeling issue, we we feel that the industry itself is likely not sure about what to do with the labeling because in one of the meetings that we had with the Food and Drugs Authority the head of the Ghana Traders Union Association, he clearly said that if we do and enforce something like GMO labeling, his market traders, his association of thousands of people will automatically see it as something sort of negative. So they, they will, they will, there'll be a higher charge for non-GMO. And we laughed because we said, well, that, that is exactly how the market will respond. But it was ironic coming from just the, the head of the Traders Association, seeing that aspect directly from business saying, if people are going to say one is bad and one is going to be sold at a higher price, Ghanaians will say, Wayne, this is not good. So that, that, that is on the side, but it sh goes to show that Ghana must have a labeling regime and all African countries indeed, if they do concede this um, very unfortunate GM agenda must have labeling. With the yield issue, um, I believe our neighbor in Burkina um, has always given us a good example when we've quoted examples to our policymakers that the cotton, the GM cotton um, experiment in, in, in Burkina um, revealed that they, they got more yields when they went back to the conventional uh, variety than they were getting when they were growing a GM cotton. And this is clear. This is one of our neighbors. This is on, on, on the continent. So. Uh, they came up with other reasons why they think the yield was different and, um, you know, that the, the, there should have been a little bit more, uh, um, what's it called? I forget the technical name they used, uh, backtracking or backtracing or something like that. But basically, we asked then, this is obviously an example of a lack of proper regulation and rushing in to do things. And we're talking about genetic material. So with the cowpea here, I think the way forward is that... Um, the, the facts should speak for itself. Um, uh, we, we, we hope that our you know, um, legal uh, challenge in court will yield something fruitful um, based on the facts that if the cowpea is indeed more toxic um, when the genes are, are produced uh, inside the plant, 
then this is something that should be considered um, and not allowed. I think that agroecology should also be uh, promoted um, from educational curricular level so that we dispel this rumor that the planet can only be fed by this large scale agriculture. I was, on, I was listening to a radio show in the morning one day in Ghana last week and very intelligent radio um, presenters were saying that um, the, the, he was advocating for glyphosate as, as, as a package that young farmers need, you know, inputs into farming. And I was just surprised at how, you know, the, the, the whole issue of business and, and, and farming has made it, um, you know, attractive to even people who should think better. So there should be education so that we change the narrative that agroecology cannot feed the planet. Um, and we should also ensure that um, we ourselves encourage more seed saving um, because the, the reality is that with all these in, in incursions, in our sovereignty, if we don't continue to grow the seeds, save the seeds, um, then these things will happen. So we should encourage uh, seed saving and more agroecological practice, um, and 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 just collaborate as we are doing as a as a as a, as a group on the continent, um, and and give each other support. Uh, it would be very nice for Nigeria to challenge uh, what is going on in Nigeria. The fact that Nigeria is this most populous nation, I mean, just the impact on, on a staple food. And I remember one day when I met a Nigerian colleague of mine years ago, and I asked him, what's your favorite food? And in my mind, I always used to think that it would be something like a bar with, and he said, beans, beans. And I said, I said, oh, this is about 20 years ago. And later then I got to find out how many beans <laughs> varieties and why beans is his favorite. So just to end on that note, you know, this, 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 this should be defended. And I thank you all for the kind of platforms uh, and support that you give um, for this kind of work to continue. Okay, thank you so much, Edwin, um, for those um, remarks. So we'll, we'll just go straight to the next panelist because time is not on our side. So I'll call on you, um, Lovelyn, Ejim. Are you there, Lovelyn? I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Lovelyn, can you hear us? Uh, it looks understand? like she's having a challenge with internet. Okay, so is, is Omer online? Omer? Hey, hello, bonjour. Bonjour, Omer. Oui, um, je n'ai pas la traduction, hein. J'ai mis la traduction en français, mais je ne reçois rien du tout. Bon, je vous écoute. Okay. Uh, do you have trans? I, did, it, did you say you don't have translation? Je suis allé dans euh, là où il faut mettre la transition en français, la traduction. J'ai mis, mais je n'ai rien reçu. Okay. We, we also. Joyce, do you have the, are you hearing the translation, translator? No, it looks like translation is down right now. Yes, because I also can't hear the interpretation for, for Omer. Yeah. Idre, can you assist? Yes, and we also can't hear the trans, his, his translation. Bon, je peux intervenir, dites-moi. Okay, can peux... someone try to... Yes. Can someone try to hear you? Oui, je vous en... je t'entends. Allô? Um, sorry, he is translating. So, um, sorry, just to clarify, there was a problem because both the translators started to translate together. So please, Stanley and Femi, will you decide who is translating from now on? Just one of the two of you. Okay, um, Stanley's saying he's busy translating. Okay, great. 
Okay, so Femi, don't worry. Um, Stanley's translating at the moment. Um, maybe Sabrina, we could just ask at this moment if we can go on 10 minutes more just to wrap up the last speakers. Yes, yes, please. Okay, so Omer, um, uh, just to, if, if it's possible for you to share um, what your thoughts are with regards to the introduction of BT Cowpea and how this is going to impact on pharmacy systems, uh, farmers' rights and production practices, um, given the issues that you know our scientists have raised in this meeting, but also you, you in Benin have last, is it last month, you, there was a lovely cowpea festival that was taking place in Benin. And you know you, you you have quite a lot of experiences as farmers on the ground. So, what are your thoughts with regards to this introduction of BT crop, BT cowpea, and also in your own experiences, what what do you think are the alternatives? So, on over to you, uh, uh, Omer. And we only have unfortunately um, five five minutes um, because you're also trying to keep uh, time. So, go ahead, Omer. Très bien. Je peux, pa je peux parler français, non? Oui. <laughs> D'accord. Très bien. Voilà. Je voudrais remercier les initiateurs de, de ce panel. Et je vais aller directement en disant que moi, je suis paysan et je suis paysan. Nous sommes d'une organisation qui est un peu au nord du Bénin. Nous, nous avons aussi et nos producteurs proches de la frontière du Nigeria dans la commune de Chaourou. Donc, euh, et la question de la semence est une question fondamentale, pas seulement pour les paysans, mais pour tout le monde. Parce que lorsqu'il n'a pas de semence, il n'a pas de nourriture. Si on prend le cas des pays africains, on ne sera jamais indépendant si on n'est pas indépendant vis-à-vis -vis de la nourriture. Donc, nous, nous travaillons depuis 2014 et sur la question des semences du Niébé, je commence par le Niébé, sinon et on se, nous travaillons euh, sur la question de la semence en général, mais comme nous sommes dans le cas du Niébé, je vais parler rapidement du Niébé. Depuis 2014, nous avons commencé par travailler avec nos collègues paysans, parce que moi, mais je suis paysan et je suis à la coordination de l'Organisation des ruraux pour une agriculture durable au Bénin. Donc, euh, nous avons commencé avec euh, neuf variétés de Niébé. Lorsqu'on a compris que le, les variétés de Niébé, la biodiversité en Niébé est en train de, 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 de s'aménuiser, on est allé voir nos amis paysans et on a commencé par travailler ensemble. Et, et on, est, on a été appuyé par une organisation qu'on a appelée BD, une organisation française et, et qui s'appelle BD. Donc, on a travaillé avec nos camarades de 2014 à ce jour. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes à 19 variétés de Niébé, et variétés paysannes, variétés paysannes. Nous sommes allés au sens de recherche du Bénin. Sur, nous sommes allés voir s'ils ont encore des variétés de Niébé. Ils n'ont rien dans le sens de recherche. Cela voudra dire quoi Cela voudra dire qu'il y a une crise de confiance entre les paysans et, et, et la recherche. Maintenant, nous, nous avons pris en compte, nous avons pris nos responsabilités. Parce qu'on a compris que le Niébé est une culture négligée au Bénin, et je crois que c'est un peu partout. C'est comme ça qu'en 2015, lorsqu'on était à la réunion de l'organe directeur à, à Rome, oui, je m'arrête. Oui. Omer. Oui. Excusez-moi. Omer. Mm. Je m'arrête. Um, mm. Can you please speak slowly? So ah, that doucement. They... Doucement. Yeah. Hein? D'accord, d'accord. Donc, c'est Maria Maillet, Maria Maillet de ACB en 2015, nous a dit qu'il y a des essais de Nébé BT au Nigeria. Ah, là, ça devient vraiment intéressant. On dit qu'il a des essais de Nébé BT à nos frontières, parce que le Bénin est frontalier du Nigeria. Et on connaît comment nos frontières sont poreuses. Nos frontières ne sont pas des frontières. Tout le monde passe et revient comme il veut. Et jusqu'à ce jour, personne ne maîtrise encore les OGM. 
Lorsqu'on parle de la biosécurité, les pays africains sont complètement à côté. Les paysans ne sont pas informés, la société civile n'est pas informée et nos gouvernements n'ont pas les instruments nécessaires pour contrôler l'entrée et les sorties de toutes les semences et de la biodiversité. Cela voudra dire que nous ne pouvons jamais faire confiance à ce qui rentre et sort entre le Nigeria et le Bénin. Donc, je voudrais dire que nous avons um, travaillé... Unfortunately, we can't... I'm not sure ah. if the, anyone else Just is hearing. Moment. There is no translation. Ah, bon, um, d'accord. Donc, ou bien je laisse. Stanley, we, we can't hear you. But, but you, 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 you can you me take over, please, if uh, Stanley's translation is having problems, please. I mean, I think it's they're almost rounding up. People can hear uh, Stanley from the chats. Yes, we can. Jaret, c'est ça? Jaret, tout de je continue, madame. Hello, Jaret? Okay, apologies um, for that uh, technical problem. Um, okay, Deidre, can you advise? Um, because I know we, we're also chasing time. Yes, um, so, okay, so please, Femi and Stanley, decide who's going to continue so you don't both interpret. So I, I think Femi should just take it out. Stanley seems to be having connection issues. So since we are almost already done, Stanley, uh, Femi should just uh, take it out from here. Can, yeah, can you tell uh, um, Omer to, to try and speak in, in two minutes because we, we we want to also have Lavin speak and then uh, Yeah, yes, yeah, Stanley, but I, we think um, Femi should just uh, take it up to the end since your internet is not so strong. So we don't, because uh, we're already out of time, yes. Est-ce qu'une autre personne uh, peut Omer. donner la parole le temps que Omer euh, retrouve dans la Allô? technique? Allô? Allô? Je vous écoute? Allô? Allô? Non, je, Omer. Je vous entends, je vous entends. Allô? Okay, so can, 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 Omer, can, you conclude, can you conclude in French? We will find a way to just find, uh, Nemo says conclude in French without translation because it's also important. And then we'll find a way to translate for the public later on. Voilà, je peux continuer un peu en français rapidement et pour laisser la panel, pas pour laisser le panel aux autres. Alors, je voudrais dire que nous nous sommes tellement exposés, on a aujourd'hui 19 variétés sous les mains et c'est un grand danger que le Nigeria ait sorti la variété, une variété BT, soit disant que à cause du, de Marouka. Marouka. Et le professeur hum, eh, eh, Mohamed, ou bien, oui, il s'appelle Mohamed Isiaku, qui a dirigé les travaux. Moi, je vois que les arguments qu'il a avancés ne sont pas assez suffisants pour qu'on aille au Nébé BT. On n'a pas besoin de Nébé BT. Et aucun paysan, je crois que l'association la, des consommateurs sont là, aucun paysan, aucun consommateur n'a jamais demandé aux chercheurs d'aller leur trouver un soi-disant nébé BT. Nous, on est en train de produire aujourd'hui du nébé en agroécologie. On n'utilise même pas les pesticides chimiques classiques. Hein? On, et, et on, même dans nos paysans, il a des, nos paysans ici, nos camarades ici, produisent du nébé sans aucun traitement. Et depuis 2014 on, on est, 2014, on est en train de suivre le processus. Et de plus en plus, on trouve des solutions, vraiment. Et on veut aller même juste à un niveau où on, on ne fera même pas les traitements bio. Voilà, la recherche continue. Donc, nous, 
on a travaillé avec des chercheurs, des chercheurs engagés, nous on a fait des chercheurs alliés, avec qui on a travaillé et pour produire du débit en agroécologie depuis 2014. Je ne trouve pas aujourd'hui les, les raisons suffisantes, euh, suffisantes pour que le Nigeria nous propose du NBBT. Encore, est-ce que le Bénin a un accord avec le Nigeria pour que euh, 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 le Nigeria envoie du NBBT au Bénin Si un jour, je pose la question à tout le monde, hein, je pose la question aux chercheurs, euh, à tous ceux qui sont autour de la table, et si nous trouvons ici au Bénin du NBBT transgénique, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas euh, intenter de, un procès euh, au, 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 au Nigeria Je trouve que ce n'est pas juste que le Niébé transgénique traverse nos frontières sans l'avis de notre gouvernement, sans l'avis des consommateurs. Parce que déjà, il a les marchés qui sont autour de nous, les marchés frontaliers qui, qui, où il a des échanges et tout. Je suis sûr qu'aujourd'hui, le Niébé euh, BTD au Bénin, si jamais ce Niébé venait et, et, et détruit, nous, le, le patrimoine de Niébé qu'on a aujourd'hui, notre, notre variété, qu'est-ce que le Nigeria fait pour arranger cela Donc, nous, nous sommes très exposés par rapport à cette question de Niébé BT et je crois que nous, nous devons engager la lutte sur deux fronts. Un, de, sur le plan politique, nous devons travailler avec nos États pour qu'on arrête cette là et en collaboration avec les paysans nigériens, en collaboration nigérien, en collaboration aussi avec la société civile nigériane. Deux, nous devons continuer par maintenir la biodiversité du Niébé que nous avons. Nous avons 19 variétés que nous conduisons et que nous, nous voulons vraiment continuer à travailler sur ces 19 variétés. Et je crois que et voilà et un, un peu de mots parce que je ne suis pas seul et, et ce que nous faisons et ce que nous pensons faire dans les années à venir. Je voudrais, si vous permettez, vous donner la parole. OK, thank you so much, Omer, and um, apologies for the technical um, hitch with the translation, but we've had you. And I think what you're trying to say is that that the um, introduction of BT cowpea is not just a threat for Nigeria as a country, but for the West African region as it's, uh, because, you know, we, we have cross-border movements. We, we, we have these interactions between these two countries. So it's, it's great, it's, it's important. And as you have mentioned, the uh, efforts by these two countries for food sovereignty movements of, of these two countries to come together politically to challenge what is happening in Nigeria because it's definitely having going to have um, an implication to the rest of the West African countries that have cowpea producers. Um, so moving on, uh, Lavlin, Jim, are you there? Lavlin and Jim? Um, Joyce is is a gym online. I can't see her, but I can't. I can't um, her microphone is not on. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to follow up with her to see what uh, what happened. I think her microphone is on, but it looks like uh, she, she's having either audio or connection issues. So, could okay. you call her through WhatsApp? Maybe she could speak to her and then you put it on. Could be another way for her to get just call and then she can speak and then you okay, mm. okay. In the meantime, um, I send this back to you, uh, Joyce or Marianne, because I think there was a Q and A session. Um, David, do we have time for questions in the meantime? Hi, I think we'll probably have to wrap up quite soon, right? Um, but maybe a few, if there are a few questions. Um, Joyce, you're going to be take, running that, right?
Okay, so I will just, uh, I think so far, it's, they're mostly comments that we have, but uh, one question that we can highlight is uh, from Claire. She says, if the BT cowpea contaminates traditional varieties, will the traditional uh, contaminated beans be subject to copyright patents? So she hasn't directed the question to anyone. So any of the panelists can uh, respond to that. So she says, um, if the if the BT cowpea contaminates the natural varieties or the conventional varieties, will uh, these conventional uh, ones contaminated be subjected to copyright patents? So if I may. Okay, please, Christoph. So uh, I'm, uh, I, on, I only have the perspective, of course, from Europe, but I think patent law in Africa is not that strong developed as in industrialized countries. So I would not expect a company coming to farmers which have contaminated seeds and asking them for royalties because of patent law. This would be a big surprise for me if this kind of uh, legal um, cases could be started in, in, in Africa and in Nigeria or Benin. But um, I'm, I think the issue is, is raised with the contamination and the inheritance of this transgene into the regional varieties is really a big issue for seed savers, for seed collections, for food security of farmers and food sovereignty. So I think I would take it from that angle and leave, at least for the moment, as far as I know, the issue with these patents more to the industrialized countries, but maybe you know better about. Okay. Um... Nimo, you want to add to, to that? You want to respond to the question? Yes, very, very briefly. Um, thanks for that comment, Christophe. Uh, just to say that the issue, uh, the bigger issue concerning contamination of natural varieties is not really whether uh, anyone is going to claim royalties or patent rights or rights. It's about what happens to our environment and what happens to us, what happens to human. This is a big challenge, and this is why we don't want it. They can, uh, they may decide not to collect for royalties or permit, but that is not the issue. The fact that once they contaminate our food system, crop system, uh, eventually we may not have the varieties, local varieties anymore, and so we'll be dependent on buying their seeds from the shelves. This is a threat that is coming. Thank you so much, Nimuan. Thank you, Christoph, for uh, your response to that question. I think uh, it's something we have to be very much concerned about, the fact that the indigenous people's crops shall, uh, will already be contaminated and mostly, most times there's no way to recall, to recall that contamination. So we'll, I think we should see if uh, Loveling has good connection now, otherwise we'll probably just take, highlight a few comments and then uh, round up the meeting. Loveling, can you hear us? Looks like she's completely dropped off. Um, Joyce, I think she has uh, dropped a, a number of messages at the chat box. I mean, this is the issue of technology. That is why, I mean, she's a farmer, she, she's in a rural area. She did her best to come out to um, be part of this discussion, but she has sent a number of chats that people can go through it. That is why we challenge these GMOs. Look at what if it, this technology, if it's the one that we can see is happening like this, how much more the one that they are putting inside and poisoning our tummy, what would happen to people? So I think we can read up, uh, people can go through our chats and we can begin to wrap up this. She's really having problems with joining. Okay. So um, Sabrina, you, you want to round up the panel session now? So thank you so much, um, Omer. Thank you, 
Edwin for those insights from Ghana, Omer from those insights from Benin. And we've seen, I think, I've, I've just seen one comment. I think the rest uh, could be up. But um, Lovelyn says, no matter how they try pushing in this modified crops and the people are fully educated about it, the problem will cause uh, uh, there after most farmers will not farm it. I think she's trying to say that most farmers won't really accept the fact that, you know, even if you know they push for the adoption of these GM crops. But also I think it's, it's an issue of awareness if they, you raise awareness to the farmers so that they know um, what the implications are uh, on these issues. Um, so quite a lot of things have been mentioned um, and I don't want to repeat um, and also just in the, in, in the interest of time, uh, we, we want to thank you, our panelists, for you know having farmers' voices in this forum. Because at the end of the day, it's the farm, farmers who will be given the seeds to to cultivate, and there needs to be you know um, synergies, uh, connections. We need to have to really push that they we do not accept. You know, uh, Mariam said the genetic engineering of our heritage. We should not allow them to contaminate uh, you know, an African crop, a center of origin um, for, for cowpea. You know, we, we, this is unacceptable. We cannot accept this to happen. So we, we still continue to call for the ban of GM cowpea in Nigeria, the ban of GM cowpea in the rest of Africa. Um, so over to you, Joyce, and thank you so much. Um, All right, thank you so much, Sabrina, and thank you to all the panelists all, and to everyone who has uh, dropped a comment, who has tried to uh, uh, make the conversation flow in the chat box. Thank you. So we will make the record, the recording will be available on the Home F YouTube channel. I've shared the link. I think I'll try to drop it again so we can go over the discussion again and again. and. Um, our email addresses and website has been shared as well. So you can you can follow up with your questions and comments even after today. Uh, you will agree with me that we've had very uh, rich discussions. And like we said, um, it doesn't end here at all. Some of the key things we've talked about today are the, 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 the way these approvals or this uh, processes affect the rights of our people to decide what they want to eat, what they want to farm. And it's something that we have to take um, very seriously. And then on the other hand, uh, we noted that this is not just a Nigerian problem. Like uh, uh, Omer said, there is transboundary movement of this product. And then other countries are in line are other, uh, under pressure to also adopt this technology. So it's something we all must continue having conversations about, especially because um, the, the promoters of these products and other GMOs in Nigeria, uh, they, they actually are trying to encourage other uh, countries to do this thing. But then from the assessment that has been done, from the review that has been done, it is shown that um, uh, they talked, there, are, there are a number of concerns, um, as uh, Christoph highlighted. The one is that the toxicity of the plants to non-target organisms, which has um, also been mentioned several as the discussions are going on, um, has been underestimated. Um, uh, we need much more detailed risk assessment before this product is actually um, being given to farmers. Unfortunately, here in Nigeria, farmer, it's already been distributed to farmers across the country. So um, there's also the risk for gene flow to wild um, varieties of the cowpea. So um, the need for collaborations, the need for synergy, the need for stronger campaign against this product is not something that we can underestimate. So um, we'd like to really thank you so much for coming for joining and um, for all your contributions thus far. We hope to um, be able to engage more and for our food systems to be um, preserved and so that we have food that do not 
um, cause problems for our health or cause problems for uh, our environment and biodiversity. So um, thank you once again to all of our speakers and to all the participants who will draw the curtain on this note. Um, you can just for one minute, look out for the link to the YouTube channel so you can get the recording afterward. Uh, Sabrina, you have any closing remarks? No, not, not for me, Joyce. I think you've said it all. Um, just to thank you and we, from ACB are in solidarity and we support uh, with ban, we support with you know, the rejection of you know, you know, pushing for false solutions onto our African continent and our African people. And we continue with this campaign, um, Aluta Continua. All right, thank you so much. So from Home F, we say big thank you to everyone for joining. And we look forward to more collaborations in the future. Hello. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Um, bye. Say Victoria Asata. Yeah. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank, thank you. you everyone. Bye, thank you for being part of this. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 I thank, thank the you. presenters and I thank the scientists that came. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, everyone. Sisters all over Africa, thanks for coming. Thank Let's you. keep up the fight. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. More strength. Be safe. Eat safe too. Bye.